Um, so uh, the speaker today is Misa Marias Vien, um, and uh, he's an assistant professor at industrial and systems engineering at computer science uh, in computer science at USC. Uh, before USC, he was a postdoc uh, uh, in the Department of in Electrical Engineering at Stanford. He got his PhD from Professor Tom Lewell. Uh, he obtained a master's in mathematics uh, under uh, under Professor uh, Lebesnik at University of Minnesota. I'm oh, sorry. He got a uh, he got a PhD in the University of Minnesota and a master's uh, uh, from Minnesota. Minnesota. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, and then uh, he's a recipient of IEEE Data Science Workshop Best Paper just this year. Um, a signal processing young uh, signal processing society young author best paper in 2014, uh, finalist for best paper for young researcher in continuous optimization in 2013 and 2016, and he has a lot of research interests which include design analysis of large scale optimization algorithms that arise in modern data science. And today he will be discussing uh, optimization of min max schemes. Exactly. Oh, thank you so much for. That. Uh, very nice introduction, and thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. <laughs> it's very difficult to yeah. pronounce my special last name. Uh, so my name is Mason, uh, and today I'm going to talk about learning why a non-convex min-max game or min-max optimization. My research is general optimization, you know, especially optimization problems that arise in modern applications. This is a joint work with my former student Maher, who joined American University of Beirut, Tianjin, my current student Mazia and my group who joined EA Sports, Tina, uh, my current student, Jimmy Ba at the University of uh, Toronto, Vector Institute, Jason Lee at Princeton, and uh, Ahmed at Facebook Research. And please stop, feel free to stop me at any time if you have questions. And general theme of my talk is about solving non-convex min-max games or min-max optimization. So basically you have an objective or you have two players that one of them tries to min minimize an objective, the other one tries to maximize the objective. So they are competing against each other. And like some technical terms, these are I'm assuming convex terms and I'm assuming you're, you have a function that gradient lips is non-convex. And we are going to assume the theories and everything that I explained, they will be generalized to stochastic settings there will be even to non-smooth cases. And my goal here is to tell you a little bit why is this problem important, why am I focusing on solving this optimization problem, and some of um, why is it challenging, and some of its applications. You already have to come here. Let me start by telling you some of the applications. Um, you're an expert there, so you already know some of the applications. So when we want to design a system that's robust against certain uh, parameters, you can design for the nominal value, which is minimizing theta, which is minimizing your objective, respect to theta, and you have the nominal value of alpha, or you can have a robust design, meaning that you allow yourself certain perturbation against alpha parameter, and you can design your parameter, your system for perturbation or the unknown parameter alpha that you have. For example, in massive MIMO applications, people recently look at what happens if you do not know the channels exactly and you want to maximize the proof without the channel. Another application is robustness in adversarial attack. I'm going to come back in all of these applications later in my talk. I want to introduce these problems first. <coughs> so you have seen probably this picture a lot, but Panda is the more Panda is good always. So this is a Panda. This is a result of so your so your excuse my hand can I use the laser pointer <laughs> so you, you see that that neural network here classifies panda image with 57 percent confidence it's a high confidence because we have a lot of categories here if you add a very small perturbation to it we get this image it's classified as given with 99 and this is not just for this particular example. You can basically get any regularly trained neural network. For example, this is a digit of zero from MNIST. You can add a small perturbation. These images are a little bit different with each other. They look similar. 
But you can see that the neural network classify this one as one, this one as two, this one as three, this the last one as nine. So with just adding a little bit of perturbation, you can uh, see or fold the neural network. And in this one, a standard formulation is to look at it as a min-max formulation. Instead of regular minimizing the training loss, you allow yourself to allow existence of an adversary in your training that you want to basically minimize your performance or minimize your training loss even in the presence of an adversary or you're trying to minimize your loss in the worst case loss. If there exists an adversary that tries to uh, change your input with delta by delta active noise. This is the delta that's added to the noise, to the image. Any questions? Okay. Another application is generative adversarial networks. And then you want to generate samples that they look like real samples. Uh, so you are experts here, so I'm not going to go through the details, but it's basically the problem is that you have a random variable Z input. You want to design a network G here that G of Z has a distribution of interest. For example, if you want input be Z, the input image, and looks like the Monet painting after going through this neural network. So a popular formulation for this problem is GANS, generative adversarial networks, that you have two neural networks competing with each other. One tries to generate images that they look real. So I have Z that generates generator, generates images, tries to generate images that they look like they look real. Another one, discriminator, that tries to get samples from the generated samples and also get samples from the real data and try to discriminate which one is real, which one is fake, generated by the generator. So these two are competing against each other. <coughs> when discriminator is very successful, means that the generator is not doing a good job in generating fake images. And the goal of the generator basically is to deceive the discriminator. And again, this is modeled as a zero sum game for training two neural networks, the objective of them are negative of each other. And there are different formulations of it, but they are all non-convex mean max problems. Which I won't go through. <coughs> Any questions? All right. So I want to also spend one slide telling you why non-convex mean max. Yeah, sure. So does the R no matter? Oh, the order matters? Uh, well, depends on the application. Yes, in some applications, the order matters. For example, uh, let's go back, for example, in this one. I want to design a neural network where the weights of theta is are the weights of the neural network that it works best for the worst case adversary, okay? So your goal, your final goal is the one outside, the train the neural. If your goal is to design an attack, you are an attacker, and you want to design an image that works for all neural networks, you, you may want to switch this. But in some applications, people like uh, GANs, uh, people say that looking at it also as a, and sometimes looking at it as a game is also valid. Um, like there's a paper by Goodfellow, 2018 ICLR, that he argues that even looking at the game, Ignoring the order, and also you get the same result. <coughs> so if basically if you look, if you ignore the order, it means that the two players are playing without like having pride that this one is having more power than the other. So, question. Okay. So I want to also spend one slide telling you why this mean max problems are challenge. So. We know that non-convex optimization is challenging. Okay, why min-max is more challenging? Why I'm interested in min-max? And to understand the challenges of min-max, let's compare and contrast it and putting it side by side by real regular minimization. This is a robust training of neural network. This is, for example, a regular training. So if you start, if I give you a minimization of a function, non-convex, you can grab something off the shelf. You can apply projected gradient descent. And it doesn't typically require a lot of training for gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent. It requires training, it requires tuning, but it's 
most of the time works, okay? at least for simple problems. And the good thing about this problem is that when you start tuning or when you start training over time, your performance improves. So whenever you stop, you always have a better performance than where you started. Okay? It's not an exhaustive search method, gradient descent, there are lots of theories that it works in many cases. We even have convergence guarantees, lower bound theoretically is well understood, we know what's that. Uh, Basic optimization theory for lower bound, we know that gradient descent actually uh, matches the lower bound, so iteration complex is lower and upper bound, we know it. But when we want to replicate everything in the min max problems, we really don't know what should we do. People do different tricks, like a popular thing is gradient descent ascent, meaning that you do multiple steps of gradient descent with respect to theta or one step, the multiple step or one step of gradient ascent with respect to alpha. But what happens in practice, you see a lot of training plots like this. This is one that um, my student obtained after tuning for two days, apparently. And we didn't see like we are converging to somewhere. So you don't see this is going down or up. And the reason is that you have two players going up and down. So you do not see that you're converging. And actually, it's not hard to make counterexamples for this gradient descent algorithm, descent ascent to fail. Even for simple functions like theta times alpha, if you start from any point, not zero point, and you do the gradient ascent descent algorithm, the optimal point is the point at the center, but you see that you go into these spirals and you move away from the optimal actually. So it's not difficult uh, to even construct simple cases that this algorithm that people use fail in practice. This is uh, in contrast with gradient descent when you are minimizing the function. Now, it's not even clear what we should hope to compute. Is it what is computable theoretically, meaning that you can do it and you can compute it in polynomial time? What is not computable? And so let's start by defining the concept that we hope we can compute, stationary concept. So for this optimization problem, I'm going to consider a game perspective in that I look at it as two players, so the order does not matter in my presentation. <coughs> and since they have non-convex objective functions, they are going to compute their Nash, first order Nash equilibrium or local Nash equilibrium. By first order Nash equilibrium, I mean the theta player. This is, you can think of it as first order optimality condition. This is for constraint, for unconstrained says that the gradient should be zero with respect to theta player, and the alpha player should have also gradient zero, meaning that the derivative of their own objective is zero, meaning that they are both happy locally at least, but just looking at their gradient. So you have, for example, the Gantt context, you have the discriminator, you have the generator, as long as, as both of them, they cannot improve their objective by just using the gradient or stochastic gradient, then you're happy. So let's say we are interested in computing such a point. <coughs> the first question is, does it exist always? And the answer is yes, that's a good thing that although the Nash equilibrium even may not exist for non-convex problem, this concept always exists. And that's why basically makes all these trainings, GANs, and everything. The hope for searching such a point is you always able to find it. But can we compute it in a reasonable time? Can we compute it? polynomial time algorithm. And to do computation, we're never able to find exact things, so I might need to define an epsilon accurate solution. <laughs> and I'm going to relax these larger than or equal to zero to minus epsilon and this one to epsilon. And I'm asking a question of how fast you can find such an epsilon accurate solution. Can we find an epsilon accurate solution polynomial time in terms of one over epsilon or not? And let's start this with a, like a thought experiment. Uh, so let's say that I ignore for now that this is a mean max problem. Let's say I call this one g of theta. And I try to minimize this g of theta. That's basically what I'm doing. Now, let's say if I can do hypothetically a gradient descent in g, then I can. 
Now, the first question is, is this differential? Is it, can we compute some notion of gradient or some gradients for it? <laughs> and it turns out that even, for example, in simple cases like this, when this is strongly concave in alpha, so if the inner problem is strongly concave in alpha, the outer problem, even if it's non-convex, this G would be differentiable. You can show that it's differentiable. And the Donsky's theorem, this is an old theorem, tells you that you may not be able to get analytically what G of theta is, but you can evaluate the gradients of G. And the way that you do it is that you solve this inner problem approximately, take the gradient with respect to alpha, with respect to theta, and that gives you the gradient of G. And that's basically the conceptual algorithm. And you can make this algorithm rigorous by basically by, by analyzing how many iterations you need to do this, how many steps you need as the outer loop. So it's a two loop algorithm. The first loop tries to compute an approximate solution of this. The second loop tries to do one step of gradient descent. And you can basically compute how many gradient evaluations you need. And these are uh, do you need log or the log one or epsilon iteration to compute an approximate solution? You need this many iterations to compute the gradient stationary with respect to theta. <laughs> and basically, we get a case at least that we can find an epsilon accurate solution, epsilon accurate solution in polynomial dependency on one over epsilon. And this rate is actually theoretically optimal up to logarithmic factors. And you can also generalize it a little bit, for example, to cases that you have convex composite with affine, which I have uh, a lot of cases such as regression, largest case regression. But can we extend it further? Can I remove strong concavity assumption on alpha? And let's do one step. Let's say that it's concave, but not strongly concave in alpha. Uh, this, in this case, g is no longer differentiable, but the simple trick is to smooth by approximate g and the smooth by it. And, uh, and uh, actually, a reasonable trick to do smoothifying is to add an approximation and choose we are need to basically do this approximation uh, wisely because we want to find the solution of the original problem, not the approximation. And we can repeat the theory that we had. Basically, we can, I can approximately solve the inner problem with the approximation. So we added regularizer. Okay. Uh, and then solve this one, uh, this problem. <coughs> now, the algorithm that you get is this. You have an extra regularizer here. Okay. And you need to basically, this is a two-loop algorithm. So the inner loop is computing the solution to this. And the outer loop does one step of gradient descent with respect to theta. And again, you can analyze it, and you see that with this simple algorithm, uh, that you just add a regularizer to the thing. And if you choose your lambda small and that's small enough, or the epsilon, you can guarantee that it's solving the original problem. And it actually improves over the existing literature, okay, just or the epsilon minus 3.5 versus epsilon minus 4, which is the, which is the known rank in the literature. But just doing it this simple. Yes. Um, I mean, the, the, these are worst case scenarios. In practice, have you compared directly and seen how much better yours? Because there also might be, say, uh, coefficients that might be higher for yours and lower for theirs. Yes, there, sh there could be coefficients as well. <coughs> In, so I'm going to show you some numerical experiments. So we have a, uh, so I'm going to show you some numerical experiments. In practice, the problem, but just to give you a short answer, also all these algorithms also. Problem is that they depend on a lot of parameters of the functions, that estimating them is difficult. So if I want to criticize is that they depend all of the, in all of these parameters, and you can always, uh, in many cases, make uh, one algorithm more faster than the other, especially with complex problems, if you do tuning. Why alpha and k update and what the what is can you uh, the alpha needs to be up and k time uh huh and why it is k instead of just one and what is why it's k? just one well yeah. what happens if it's just one that's your question okay if I just updated one 
in many cases, actually, you do not get convergence, and you can, you can actually verify it by, like, training even a, a simple, for example, gap. Theoretically, also, the best rate that you get in that case is epsilon minus 4, epsilon minus 4, and that's more restricted assumptions. Theoretically, even, it's this work loop, okay. it's when alpha k is 1, when, when k is 1, sorry. K is one, so just doing one iteration. And that's theoretically what you get. And I don't know, and it's under much restrictive assumptions, that's what we have. So, for example, it requires compact assumption, compact set. Also, uh, and I do not know whether you can improve that one if this rate can. Okay, that's a very good question. Practice, what's the value in the future? Yeah, no, well, okay. In practice, the value of doing multiple steps is that when you do the gradient respect to gen generator, this is discriminator, it's much more informative for you. So it's, you get a much better discriminator that is much more helpful for you to do this step. So people also try to uh, do more complex versions of this to get basically this idea of getting much more uh, much better discriminator by, for example, doing unrolling idea of not only do it this, but you propagate this gradient inside these gradients. And so this would also, but this comes at the cost of making things more complex of doing unrolling. It requires more computation. But the high level idea is that your gradient is actually a good estimation of the gradient of the function g that I defined. This function g, your gradient is a good approximation of this gradient if you do multiple steps. If you do one step, it's not a good approximation. This is a short question. But let me tell so let me tell you, are these results useful in practice? So that's a that's a question. I told you all of this, and I'm assuming like we have concavity with respect to inside parameter. But we do not have in many applications, so let's try to see if we can apply some of these theory applications. <clears throat> let's start by the example of training robust neural networks. I have a that, that's the story that you know. So the regular training is that you minimize the training loss, and this xi's are your data points, w are the weights of the neural network that you're training, and this is a robust version, robust optimization version that for each training data point, you try to find a perturbation delta that makes it worse. You can also put an index i, if you like, that your perturbation is for that data. <coughs> and one the standard approach, which was proposed by Madri, is uh, to repeat these two steps, apply multiple steps of gradient ascent on delta. So apply multiple steps of gradient ascent on your image to make your training loss larger, then use reinitialize it multiple times, use the worst image as input, as, as your input, and try to do a gradient descent on your parameters of the node, or do back from respect to the parameters. So that, and this you do it at each iteration, instead of doing one gradient to multiple. The, there's no theoretical convergence, or it guarantee, and it's not scalable. They also say that it's not scalable. And requires heavy tuning. So it requires So this can we apply our theory to this problem? Let's start with this. <coughs> and again, the problem is that this inner problem is again not concave. Our theory only applies when you have a concave with respect to delta and not convex with respect to delta. Yes. Is it possible that in a classification problem, two classes are like uh, uh, intrinsically very close, so the perturbation will like, overlap? Two classes are very close. Yeah, okay. so your, your, your perturbation is very small, you mean, to make one to the yeah. other? I, I mean, is it possible that uh, two classes are intrinsically very close in the space? So it could be. So, there, so your perturbation will necessarily overlap? It is true. It could be the case, okay? It could be the case that two classes are very close to each other and your perturbation is really easy to uh, pull any network. 
Okay, but it's not true for any class. Like right now, the examples that we have, you can bring any two classes very close to each other by perturbation. It's not like that. You have two classes that they are close, and you can make them. Then you can pull them around. It is like any even far classes you can bring them close with very small perturbation. Did I answer your question? So, so let's approximate this with a concave function because we, our theory requires a concave function. And the way that we did it, uh, let's say these are the outputs of the softmax layer. I want to do training, for example, on MNIST. <coughs> and the way that we approximate this function, we a concave function is we first approximated the finite number of adversaries. And the way we did it is uh, said, okay, let's say that I have nine or ten adversaries. Okay. The first adversary tries to make the output to look like zero, given the parameters of the network. So D zero is the direction that adversary zero is adding to your image to change the label to zero. And you do it for all the nine adversaries. You have all tier nine uh, adversary classes. So what is D0? Z, D0 is, we define it as the gradient of the output of submax. Uh, we can do it even before submax. With respect to zero label, minus the gradient with respect to the correct label. So what is this is D0 is doing? It tries to maximize the likelihood of the network classifying this as a zero label and tries to minimize the probability that it classifies it as a correct label. So it goes to the direction that a basic perturbation that sees the target of the path. Tries to maximize this and minimize this. And you can do it even multiple times. But you still have a D0, which is a function of W and X. It is five times. These five steps of gradient of these guys in it. And now I need to solve this optimization problem. So I need to solve mean of max of these, max of finite. I can write the inner max as a linear program. How I introduce these variables t. These t k's are defined this way. So we know for linear programming, the solution is that the uh, string points, the con can you maximize any convex function? And the solution is at the interior. So this problem is the same as this. The nice thing is that this is a concave function with respect to t, and we can apply that theory. <coughs> but it's non convex again with respect to weights of the neural network. And we compare the two, uh, two words, the Madrid's defense, and also with Cheng, Jordan's uh, group. And they do not have any theoretical convergence guarantee. Uh, this second work is actually the winner of last year uh, NIPS competition, NIPS competition in defense against adversarial attacks. And we have we saw consistently that this idea of this simple idea of doing multiple adversaries <laughs> can, although you might lose a little bit in the regular performance. So this one is the method that we proposed. This is Madri's work, and this is uh, Jordan's. So it can it can outperform like, with respect to different types of attacks to the neural network, different columns. So this FGSM attack is one type of attack that is proposed in this work. EGD is another standard attack that's the, that's proposed in the second work. And these different epsilons are different uh, basic perturbation magnitude that you allow yourself. On. Any questions? Okay. <coughs> now. Uh, so we also try to apply some of our theory. And yes. Wait. Um, I recall from the paper that your your method was trained on a particular value of epsilon, right? Or am I wrong? It's on a particular value of epsilon. Yes. All of these. Very good question. Also, the benchmarks are trained on a particular value of epsilon. When so you are in some sense, in, in maybe in real life, where you don't know what that value of epsilon is, your, your the, neural network might be intrinsically correlated. Exactly, that's a very good question. Actually, what we observed is that many 
uh, in many of our experiments, we observed that many of the training defense mechanism, when you actually you change the epsilon that they train, they may perform much worse than the regular train. So they they robust against the particular small epsilon, but then you increase epsilon, actually they may be worse even than the regular train. Increase epsilon too much, it might it won't be the actual image. Actually become something That's also, yeah. If I epsilon, so you want to also increase epsilon to a reasonable value. You do not want to increase it like too much that it, you basically your adversary can replace your image with something else. <laughs> <laughs> so that's basically your neural network is going to randomly. So when you increase epsilon, best thing to do is to randomly. That's fine. So that's the one that adversary can match Yeah. Good. Question? That was very two good comments. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we try to also apply it on fair, fairness among users in learning, meaning that you have in the, the our motivation was started from this paper, uh, agnostic federated learning, that in a, you have machine learning models, you want it to work for everyone. You don't want it to be able, for example, Siri to work well, for example, for people with a certain access, uh, accent. Okay, So you want to have solve an optimization problem like this. You want to, this is a training loss, for example, with, uh, oh, with southern accent, this is, for example, Midwest accent, and you have different types of accent. And you want to minimize your error uniformly across different uh, people with different, uh, different groups. And again, you can do the trick of reformulating it as min max concave. And we use the basically the example that they had, basically using training on passion and this. <coughs> and you want to have a fair classification against, against different classes. And we compare it with this work. This is the proposed uh, this is our proposed work. This is the, the one that proposed for Mohri. And this is the regular training across different uh, categories. And as you can see, again, these are the mean plus minus standard deviations of that classification accuracy that you get. <coughs> and we are, so again, you can see that we are basically, uh, we basically we make red, we mark red, the worst case performance for this app for every algorithm. And you can see that our worst case performance algorithm is again better than that system. So we did the training over 100 runs, so 100 training. And in fact, with an algorithm that has a theoretical guarantee, you get much smoother uh, convergence. We also tried uh, a recent work of us that I submitted to ICLR is try to apply these theories to fairness in machine learning. And the motivation is <coughs> basically we know that the data is biased, the learned models are also could be biased. It, the bias could also happen because of different reasons. Uh, for example, there are many examples of them. For example, Amazon recruitment engine, the one that they never used but they tried to use in it, will discover that it has bias against women. <coughs> Google Online advertising, they show high income jobs ads to men more than women. There was, for example, a nice study ads for arrest records shows up, showed up for searches for distinctively black men more often. So you see that all these models that we have learned, they, there are many examples that there's bias in it. <coughs> there are different reasons for having such a bias. Could be as old data, which human involved, and they had bias in it. Uh, for example, if Amazon in the past, they had more male applicants, it is not surprising that the algorithm picks one of the features, one of the important features to classify as a male, uh, as a gen gender, as one of the important features for prediction. <coughs> and we have, there are not only ethical reasons, we either regulate the domains such as employment, housing, that it should have fair acts. And we want to have a dis discrimination-free machine learning models. Basically, to mathematically tell you, it is we have an input random variable x and s. Inside this s could 
This S is a protected feature, such as gender or race. And you want to have a model, say, for example, neural network, that uses this input and gives you a decision, y hat, that's a prediction, y hat, which in your training looks like the real one. Okay? But at the same time, you want it to be basically, want to, uh, you do not want to have bias against these protected features such as race uh, or gender. So we have two goals in mind here. One is we want to have make white hat close to white. Good prediction. Another one is that we want to make y hat close to s. Make, sorry, we want to make y hat independent of s. I don't want my prediction to be dependent on the protective features. Question? All right. <coughs> so when you have two goals in mind, the standard is like come up with an objective function that considers both of them. For example, uh, it's, uh, people tried this idea of you minimize the regular training, okay? theta, let's say, are the weights of the neural network. So you want to minimize your loss. This is your predicted value. This is the actual value. And subject to, you also have lambda times rho. Rho is a certain correlation measure that measures the correlation of your input, in the, the, basically the protected feature, such as gender, with your output. Okay. So we have two goals. Basically, this one enforces the classification error to be small. The second part tries to enforce fairness. <laughs> and people use different correlation measures, and for such as mutual information, false positive, negative rate, equals odds, uh, Pearson correlation coefficient, at sick, all of these people use in the past. We, we looked at them and we noticed that actually they either do not have convergence guarantees, meaning that the algorithm cannot, may not converge, or they cannot guarantee, in many cases, they cannot guarantee the statistical independence. And the reason is that, for example, if you use a linear correlation and you impose, you try to make, minimize the linear correlation between the protected feature and output, you are only minimizing linear correlation. There might be other types of higher order correlation uh, that you are not capturing. We know that two, two random variables could be completely correlated, but the linear correlation between them should be, could be zero. So the only one, for example, that he used was mutual information, which could guarantee its statistical independence, but the algorithm they needed to approximate it at the end with neural networks because it's very computational and inefficient. So we said, let's use the Rainey correlation between two random variables. The Rainey correlation or maximal correlation between two random variables A and B is defined this way. We try to maximize the regular correlation between them uh, when we look at all the mappings f applied to a. So you try to map one of your random variables to this, and one domain f of, by applying f, and you apply g also to b, okay? and you transform them to another domain, and you try to basically look at the correlation between them in that domain. And when you look, try to design f and g smartly to maximize this correlation. That correlation is very old cor correlation measure, uh, even goes before rain. Uh, and it captures, the nice thing about it is that it captures independence. It's a, uh, it's a normalized measure of independence, always between zero and one. It captures uh, independence, meaning that if it's zero, they are independent, if it's one, if they are uh, dependent on each other, it's going to be one. I said, now let's try to basically put this one as a correlation measure here. And if you do this, basically I'm replacing the correlation measure with the Rainey correlation, and this gives you a natural min-max optimization. I'm replacing this part with a maximization problem. I can bring the max out, I get this optimization problem. <coughs> and the nice thing is that you are maximizing over function spaces, so Maximizing over function spaces is not nice, but the good thing is that most, a lot of times, the protected features are discrete. So when you're talking about discrete features, protected, uh, the, the functional space is actually, you can model it with, with, a, with, a, with a vector, because you need to say what value, what each value should map to. Right? So it's basically you're modeling every 
uh, every function with a vector you can easily. And <coughs> can be solved actually for discrete random variables. We proved that there is an old theorem that shows that actual Raney correlation can be computed as a second a singular value of matrix Q, which is defined in this way. But we proved that it can be even done faster. For example, in the binary case, a lot of cases our decisions are binary or our predicted features are binary. <coughs> and the good thing about this is that it also falls into the re uh, regime that our theory can be applied and we compare with some of the existing approaches. <coughs> we apply this on some of the standard data sets. We, uh, for example, let's look at this uh, plot. We see the accuracy versus p percent rule. What is p percent rule? p percent rule is defined in this way. So it looks at whether you, for example, you decide to interview that person or not. Subject given the condition that, for example, you have two different races, races one, race zero. Okay. So if this ratio is close to one, means that you're doing a fair job. This ratio, and you look at the minimum of the two, if this, case, if this ratio is smaller than one, it means that you're not doing a fair job. If the ratio of the people that you are interviewing, in, for example, the number of female and male, if you look at this ratio, it's it's uh, far away from or it means that you're not doing it. And as we can see, essentially, for large values of p percent rule, the other methods are dropping significantly. One reason is that they are, it's not because they are not, they cannot optimize well or they are not tuning very well. They're actually, they can optimize, they have, uh, or some of our theories can be applied to their methods as well. Yes. Um, so it's interesting that your um, method actually is following definition for fairness to run awareness, but actually your evaluation is using the sense of strategy. Only I'm, I'm uh, for for evaluations. Yes, I use it. So how can I so? so let so me. It's like using a definition for solving a problem, but the evaluation is using the exact. Problem. So the, the, it's actually the goal is to make them independent, right? If you ag agree that this is a good goal, that's, there's a, uh, but if our goal is to make them independent, what evaluation I should be able to, if I want to really evaluate it, one way is to really look at the ground truth, see if they are really correlated or not, right? I don't know if I understood your question well. So it's like, what Definition. Uh, in that case, you are saying fairness to awareness is exactly the same thing as fairness to unawareness because I'm following this method to solve it, but using the other thing. Yes. Yeah. So I'm. I'm so I may not know, or I may know even the, the protected feature during my training, but during evaluation, I use it for evaluating whether it's really fair or not. For, but. Uh, Knowing it or not knowing it in training, uh, it's both actually, we have a section that tells you in our paper that leads to the same result. Yeah, it leads to the, at least numerically, we observe that it leads to the same result. <coughs> yes, also. But the interesting part was here, we observed, and in many of these data sets, actually in these data sets, for example, the correlation was nonlinear. That's why when they impose a linear correlation as a regularizer, they saw basically the algorithm thinks it makes them basically make the algorithm fair, but in fact it's not fair because, <coughs> and you have to drop a lot basically because of, you cannot achieve, many of them you cannot achieve 100% p percent rule at all. So they need to drop here because the correlation is not really nonlinear. Yeah, so you're talking about the Pearson correlation between the model and the uh, uh, the output of the model and uh, yes, and the protected feature. <laughs> so in this case, this is a method, uh, the red one, Pearson correlation coefficient, which is defined, which is proposed in this one. Edsec is proposed in this one. So they use these measures, which are linear dependence measures, as correlation. And to try to minimize it. 
And they cannot achieve that 100% fair in law cases because they are actually the correlation uh, of the output of their model is actually nonlinear. Question? All right. And let's see. Yeah. So we have, so we have more experiments. We also extended some of our works to <laughs> training GANs. Uh, which I do not talk about, but if you are interested, I will be happy. And this is a work that we published in it. Uh, let me tell you the summary. As I try to my best convince you today that non convex mean max problems are challenging and they have a lot of applications, but we are, this is just the first step, we really do not know how to solve them in the non convex work. We took first steps. Even going beyond first order stationarity that we look at to it, even existence is a problem. For example, you can come up with simple counterexamples like this. And mean max also has a long history, starting from uh, basic variational inequalities, uh, 70s, 70s. Uh, but a lot of efforts were focused on the convex concave case, where uh, but right now, we have need for non-convex problems as well. And at the same time, a lot of efforts were focused in the case that your variational inequality is a, basically is an abstract thing. Now, our variational inequality has a structure of it's coming from a mean max problem, which hasn't been exploited. That's why a lot of recent works are trying to work in this. They, they are trying to, to exploit this knowledge. These are the list of some of the other recent works in this area. And these are some of the references that I've talked about. And the codes are available. Any questions? Oh, any questions? Let me actually leave this. Thank you for coming. Thank you.